Hello, and welcome to the Humumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown. The podcast where we watch 31 horror movies throughout the hallowed month of October. Ranging from the critically acclaimed to film school projects gone gruesomely awry. And we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hommel. And I'm your host, Sully Hommel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously while we take these movies seriously. (laughs) Our movie for today is The Silence, which is a Netflix original, as I discovered. Oh boy, was it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and oh my gosh, I was, you know, I called it a, like a ripoff of Bird Box or something, but no, this is, this is A Quiet Place. That's what movie this is. In terms of the plot of the movie and like- And every detail. The things that they're doing, yes. In terms of the quality of the movie- No. Not even close. No. And- This was the movie that you get when you let AI watch- a quiet place, yeah. and then ask it to make a movie. <laughs> and it goes, you mean you want a movie about bats? Yeah. I will say, though, my very first note, I had high hopes, because the very first note I got to write was, oops, I don't think they should have released those bats. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's a good place to start for a movie. I, yeah, I guess so. Especially Although I have so in many 2021. Issues. Yeah. That's true. But I have a lot of issues with their bats. I mean, it's just messed up. They're... All right. Tell me about your issues with their bats. Well, this is a biological problem because uh, this is in the horror genre of monster movie, but specifically the monster is supposed to be a real animal, not not an existing real animal, but something that is in the real world. Just, you know, these, these are they creatures. Baby pterodactyls. Baby pterodactyls is definitely what they were. Sabrina the Teenage Witch came up with this idea that <laughs> she was she thought, oh, they got trapped in the trapped in this cave and evolved there, which is fine, I guess, except like if it was a closed system and they eat like they do, like how's that possible? Right. How did they evolve <laughs> to want to eat all the humans and everything that yes. makes noise if they were trapped in a cave well, with only I mean, themselves? That's what they were trying to do was like, oh, it's in a cave, so they they don't, can't see, they only hear. But first of all, let's nip that right in the bud. Because bats use echolocation. These guys would definitely use echolocation because they fly. They can't, they would run into everything if they couldn't see in some way. Yes. So they do that, which means that not making noise doesn't help you. They can still see you. Yes. There's so hundred things wrong with these animals. So this is the thing I was thinking about after the movie. Yes. In horror movies and disaster movies and anything by Hollywood, they have this idea that animals are so extreme. And I was thinking about like, you know, real life dangerous animals like a crocodile. Yikes. So dangerous. But if one was 20 feet away from you, you could just look at it and be like, ooh, that's a scary animal. I better not get any closer or I better start walking away. You don't go, ah! And it doesn't charge at you. It's living its own life. It doesn't care. Like, in most cases, yeah. It's, these attacks are so rare. But in a movie, it's like these creatures are homing beams at humans. They just come at you constantly. When in reality, the only reason, well, one of the main reasons why animals attack humans is because humans go up and start like poking them with sticks and yeah, especially being alligators. obnoxious and taking their land away from them and yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's it's very wrong and like I would kind of like to see a movie like that where they treat it more like, you know, they make up this fantastical scary monster but they treat it like how it would be in real life where yeah, it's really dangerous and Let's handle it properly, but it doesn't just latch on to every human being it sees. Yeah, these these baby pterodactyls had like this OCD compulsion to mm-hmm. attack. And at one point, she even said something like they were scratching repeatedly at the same places on the car yeah. to try to get in. Like they weren't mindless in the sense that they just went crazy doing things, but they were kind of mindless in the sense that they just had to do the same <laughs> thing over and over again with the yeah. purpose of getting to whatever thing they had just heard. And it didn't even have to be living things. No, like they just threw noise. a crowbar. Yeah. 
Which and means in their cave that they came from, water would drip from the ceiling and they'd just slam their head into the ground wherever that water hits. Right? I, you know what? People who don't understand evolution shouldn't be writing movies about evolution. I'm just saying. I guess so. Um, I would lo- also like to point out how much fun it is for me that you me? are the one taking this movie way too seriously. I'm not. <laughs> Um, But I also took this movie way too seriously to the point where I almost couldn't watch it. Oh, yeah? What was your problem? Okay. Because this is a remake, a (laughs) ripoff, one might say, of A Quiet Place, the entire premise of the movie is that this baby pterodactyl creature has been released into the world and is eating everything that makes a sound. Mm -hmm. And this family whose daughter is deaf, is going to survive because they know how to be quiet. Same plot as A Quiet Place. Yep, exact same plot. Okay, the difference here is that in The Quiet Place, the daughter was born deaf. And in this movie, Sabrina the Teenage Witch was in a car accident, I think, that killed her grandparents and made her deaf. So she's been deaf for three years. (sighs) Early on... She makes a point of saying how proud her dad was of her for assimilating to being deaf so quickly. It's one of the first things she says. Then, through the entire rest of the movie, she uses almost no sign language. Yeah, I know. She looks at people's faces while they're signing at her. Mm -hmm. She can read their lips in the dark when they're (laughs) half turned away from her. There was not one realistic element to any of this, even if you don't think about the fact that people who are deaf, they can't hear. That's that's the issue I have. Which yes. means they don't care if they're making noise. <laughs> and they don't know whether they're making noise. And, like, there's nothing inherently quiet about being a deaf person. <laughs> yeah. It's just that everything else is quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There were a bunch of times in this movie where that was done to the audience, where these people would be like walking on gravel and we heard nothing because the movie wanted it to be that they were silent. Right? They're trying to escape. They get out of the car and they're sneaking away through an autumn forest. <laughs> yep. No. Uh, and the later, like, you know, somebody blinks too hard and it's too loud and, you know, yeah. one of the pterodactyls comes and gets them. Like, there was nothing realistic about this movie. So even as someone who has almost no experience with deaf culture, I saw that and I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm offended for deaf people. So I have to go find out how the deaf community received this movie. Yes. It was not well. That's what you mentioned that. Yet they were not overly fond of this movie. (laughs) They certainly compared it unfavorably to A Quiet Place. Understandably. Not just because of the storyline and how just completely inaccurate it is, but because A Quiet Place, the main character who was deaf, was played by an actress who was deaf. In fact, that actress came on set and like taught all the rest of them how to use sign language like they yeah. there was this whole culture and that was quiet place is a john krasinski movie mm-hmm. that was something he intentionally did like he created a culture of listening to deaf people <laughs> mm-hmm. and incorporating that in their movie to counter that i found that there was an interview of the director john leonetti in which he said kiernan shipka who is sabrina the teenage witch has flawless signing (laughs) and that she has an innate sense of what it's like to be a deaf person. (laughs) Which is, yikes. He describes her depiction of a deaf person as impeccable. Mm -hmm. And no, 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 absolutely not. It was terrible. And I could tell it was terrible. And the deaf community agrees with me. And... It was so painfully obvious how little effort they put into understanding deaf culture that I, like, literally every time the main character did anything, I was mad. Like, any time. And as someone who, she she could speak because she had been able to speak up until three years ago. I mean, she was like a 
late teenager, so she had most of her life been hearing. Yes. And they said one of the good things that they did, one of the rare good things that they did, was they didn't give her a deaf accent. Yeah. Which was both accurate, because she would have learned, you know, she learned to speak as a hearing person, but also would have been so offensive. Uh-huh. <laughs> Aside from that, like, it would have been one thing that she relied on speaking so much of the time if, A, they hadn't pointed out this idea that she had assimilated to being deaf so quickly. (laughs) Yeah. And B, the movie wasn't entirely based around the idea that she had to be quiet. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, that was... They put that line in there because they're like, oh, that's why we decided to put a deaf character in our movie. And it... It was pointless. There was no... I mean, it's fine that they had a deaf character, but it didn't matter in terms of how things worked. They, I think they tried to do something, like, early on. First of all, at the beginning of this movie, there's, like, narration by Sabrina the Teenage yes. Witch, which is super pointless and doesn't belong in the movie. But in it, she says something like, oh, because I'm deaf, I totally can tell what's going on around me better than other people and like you'd think that would do something in the the movie and it didn't only evidence of that in the whole movie is that like three times she noticed when her dog's hackles went up yes they kept zooming in on these hackles that were terribly (laughs) done by the way they were the worst the worst special effects but also everybody other than her could tell that the dog was barking because it was barking So Okay, but that's one of the sad parts of the movie, right? Yes, that was a sad part of the movie. There were a couple of like emotionally impactful moments, and the fact that she loved this dog, and the family loved this dog, and this dog, being a dog, trying to protect his family, kept barking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was sad. Yeah, it was... I mean, they didn't really have any choice, and that's really sad. They just they let the dog go to go attack the bats knowing that it would get killed for sure but there was nothing they could do really no it was either do that or kill the dog themselves which was what i was afraid was gonna happen Looked like it was gonna happen which would have added an interesting dynamic to the father-daughter relationship (laughs) that like wasn't there if you know if the dad had killed her dog in order to save her and the rest of the family like that would have been that would have added some interest ai didn't think of that (laughs) Um, the Netflix AI. Right? Also, Uncle Glenn, who was the dad's like best buddy, and mm-hmm. they worked on a construction crew or something together. Like At first, I was kind of annoyed by him, but then he ended up being one of my favorite characters in the whole movie, and I was really sad when he got eaten. Yeah, he got eaten quick. Yeah, it was very early. I would have liked him to stick around longer. That was interesting. That was my note that the bats keep solving problems for them. Like, that happened. Like the problem of having (laughs) Uncle Glenn around. (laughs) Yeah. But it was like, you know, it's kind of weird because the problem was that the bats were hearing what they were doing. And the bats would keep taking away the things that were making noise. So they were okay. (laughs) Which, admittedly, is not their desirable goal but then they you know they went into conflict with other people and inevitably it's always let's make it so there's noise by that person and they get eaten and yeah like the bats just keep solving they clean everything up they're just very efficient yes they definitely were so uh let's talk about speaking of conflicts that they got into and the bats cleaning it up let's talk about arriving at the super fancy cabin in the middle of nowhere, clearly being lived in by like this one little old lady. Yeah, the Walking Dead cabin. Yeah, yes. But like the Walking Dead cabin, well after someone had turned <laughs> yeah. it into a, a an anti-zombie. Yeah, it was quite place. a fort. Like, so they show up, and she comes out because the bells start to ring because she has her whole place. Like, alarmed. Not for bats, not for anything. Like, this is just how she protects herself from humans, which... Didn't go well. It's, I mean, generally, before the bats came around, it was a pretty smart idea. Yeah. And this was a great example of the bats solving problems for them. She comes out with a shotgun. She's like, get off my lawn. I'm going to kill you all. And they're like, oh, no. Hey, lady, stop making noise. Stop making noise. Uh, Okay, but they didn't. (laughs) It would have been one thing if they had done that. Okay. They did not. They They just like the bats to solve their problems. They just like looked silently (laughs) at each other like, oh, no, whatever can we do? As the bats (laughs) ate her. Yeah, picked her up and 
threw her in a fire pit for them. Again, very succinctly solving their problem. Very convenient. Very convenient. And then they got to have her house. It's like the bats were like working for them the whole movie, (laughs) requiring a few little sacrifices, but otherwise... And yet, there were scenes, literally my favorite moment, because, I mean, apparently I, I grew up in northern minnesota i i have fargo type things in my blood oh, oh, uh, yeah. literally one of my favorite moments was shortly after that the rest of the family's trying to get into the compound after the dad has snuck in and they're getting attacked and the dad turns on the wood chipper mm-hmm. and the baby pterodactyl is just like <laughs> swarm into the wood chipper. I thought was very interesting that they were like, there's noise over there. It's definitely in this hole and not (laughs) around the hole or on the sides of the hole. It's inside the hole. Definitely right inside this this chute. (laughs) Let's all go in there. (laughs) Again, evolution not really working in their favor. Speaking of their evolution, the biggest thing about these baby pterodactyls that drove me nuts they would hear a little pin drop somewhere far away and be and before they got you know before it was loud enough that they were like i'm gonna go kill it they would hear the noise and they'd go flap 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 (laughs) flap flap they were the loudest creatures on the planet there's no way they could possibly track anything by sound because they just wouldn't stop making noise and 150 million of them were living in a single cave. Yeah. What is this? Yeah. Uh, the one realistic thing about it was there were monsters that would attack you if you made noise. And everybody, like we hear on the TV people saying, stay in your house. Don't go outside. <laughs> Don't try to drive. <laughs> yes. Don't make any noise. And immediately the main characters are all like, we have to leave this house, get in our car, and drive. and drive. And let's turn up the radio. Because they wanted to get to the they wanted to get to their, you know, whatever place out in the country where it would be quiet. Mm-hmm. Like first quiet of all <laughs> Right? First of all, out in the country is where all the other animals live, making all the noise. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Honestly, if you shut everything down in a city, it's probably way quieter than in the country. Yeah, but you know what? You could you can't trust people no you cannot trust people they would be like i'm putting on my radio because freedom (laughs) is that freedom rock (laughs) we'll turn it up if you don't want to listen to your radio (laughs) fine don't listen to your radio but i'm going to listen to my radio five feet away from you (laughs) (sighs) this is yeah this is too real i don't like it But then, again, the 150 million bats in the cave. Somehow, there were enough bats in this one cave to conquer, I don't know, multiple states for sure. Possibly the whole world, because they started talking about how you had to get up above the Arctic Circle where the cold was too much for them. Yeah. Like, how many bats were in the cave? Well, okay, so one of the things, I'm not sure how close in proximity, like time proximity, the release... At the beginning True. and the actual incident was because there were several times where they found bodies. And this must have happened really quickly, though, because one of the bodies was in like the Walgreens or whatever they went into yeah. looking for antibiotics. Because we have yet another movie where infection moves at light speed. Yes, that's um, true. But so they go into the Walgreens and she finds the one body of whatever human was in there before her. And it was oh, like yeah. the baby, baby uh, pterodactyl incubator. It had like all the little egg sacs. Yeah, and because whatnot. that's that is definitely how mammals breed or reptiles, baby ter- whatever they are, <laughs> chickens, <laughs> birds. <laughs> they looked like bats to me. <laughs> they did, but you know, yeah, it didn't. It didn't seem right. Also, she's looking at them, and they're like writhing inside. It was sort of like looking at octopus eggs, right? Yeah. And they're writhing inside. And then one of them, like, squirts at her. (laughs) But they don't hatch. That was the beginning of the hatching. That's the egg tooth where it pecks at the egg and makes progress. Yeah. So anyway, there were definitely several instances where they found animals or humans that had been turned into, like, egg incubators. So that helps with their numbers, but just the biology is... Yeah. And that's not how things, real animals breed. Also... If there was a species of animal that was trapped inside a cave and that was their entire ecosystem, their gestation period would not be like 48 hours. (laughs) Probably not. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it was a big cave. I don't know. It might have been the center of the earth. <laughs> the center, this was the, the whole center thing. of the earth is just nothing but molten baby pterodactyls. <laughs> molten baby pterodactyls, <laughs> certainly. And they did show us close-ups of these vesps, as they are known. Yes. Over and over because again. Because despite the fact that they looked and acted like bats. <laughs> I know. Like, as soon they, as I saw them, I'm like, bat. That's the, the analogy word. <laughs> the movie made, because they didn't want to just do the old tired thing, <laughs> is they're like, oh, they're calling them vesps because they're like wasps. <laughs> okay. I mean, sort of. But really, they look just like bats or baby pterodactyls. Yes. But they they would show them close up a lot. And it's, you know, it, it's the whole thing you're not supposed to do in horror is show the monster. And they would show them real close. And they're just dumb little animals I going. Mean, they, rah, were, rah. they were kind of cute. Like yeah. in a different movie setting, <laughs> they would have been like somebody's pet. Yeah. Someone would, would have, have them on their shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And we would have bonded with them and all that. Okay. So. We've been talking about this movie as if this were the entire plot of the movie. <laughs> and then three quarters of the way through, suddenly it becomes an entirely different movie. You mean three quarters of the way through and what I would say is three days into this pandemic of bats? Yes. Is when a cult has already sprung up and has a whole system and does what it does to be fair it does not surprise me that a cult gestation period is three days <laughs> i don't believe it for the vests but i definitely believe it for the cult <laughs> yeah um yeah so suddenly they come across this cult of people who have all cut their own tongues out i like you do but other than that are basically just your garden variety evangelicals <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, they're a little pushy, I have to say, but yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. So they're trying to recruit them. And at first, they seem excited about the main character, this girl. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it's because she's deaf and she knows sign language. She knows well, how to be quiet. <laughs> she quote unquote knows sign language. Yeah, she knows how to be quiet, all of that. But then later, the thing that they say about her, which I'm like, oh, this is never a good sentence. There is <laughs> yeah. never a time when this sentence is appropriate to be used. They write on their little notebooks because they can't talk because they've got their tongues out, which apparently also made it so they couldn't make sound. Yeah. Impo well, he could make a little hissy snarl at one point. Yes. Anyway, they write down on their little notebook the sentence, the girl is fertile. Mm -hmm. Expecting that that would make the dad go, oh, Cool, yeah. Sure. Sure, now we want to join your cult. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, if I mean, why did they care? Were they, were they... Well, that's part of the three days thing. Like, this just happened, and we're in the end days apocalypse, where they're like, we've got to find every fertile woman we, we can. We, we haven't even finished depopulating the Earth, and we're trying to repopulate it. It's so weird. Um. Uh, there, for a minute, I was like, oh, because, you know, they want to create this new breed of quiet, deaf humans. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, she wasn't born deaf. This isn't going to work, guys. Maybe they should have discussed that with them. Yeah. Just everything about it was wrong and inappropriate and felt like it was just being shoehorned in because they were, what, like 20 minutes short on how long their movie should be? Well, I don't yeah. even know. Well, if they were short, they could have shown more than zero seconds of their trip from that Walking Dead cabin to the Arctic North. Right. Where they immediately appeared and were like, we're at the refuge, which is a place. So this movie is 90 minutes long. <laughs> We spend 60 minutes with them just getting out of town and trying, like, finding this lady's cabin, getting her eaten yeah. so that they could move into it. <laughs> yeah. That's 60 minutes of it. Then we get, like, 25 minutes of them trying to escape from this cult. Mm -hmm. And then we get five minutes of them apparently learning about and traveling all the way, uh, you know, halfway around the globe to this yeah. arctic place i mean that's that feels like they were supposed to make a series of three movies and they were like well we don't have the budget so <laughs> let's just sort of wrap it all up right here yes. 
it sort of feels like what happens to people when they start writing without a whole plot in mind <laughs> and they're like, oh, this is an interesting thing. Like, oh, oh, the, so the bats, these bats are attacking humans and they start writing it because that's the action, right? Yeah. And then they don't realize that that's not actually the story they're trying to tell. I feel like the story they needed to tell was that whole human story of like, they could have done all those same things and shown us all those same experiences over this long trek yeah. to safety. Right. But instead, the, at the end of their like little vignette about the first days, they were like, oh, but we need to show them safety. <laughs> so, um... There they uh, are. <laughs> cut to three months later. <laughs> yeah. They've literally just been walking this whole time, not making noise. <laughs> Apparently not. Even though the first three days were like the most dangerous uh -huh. thing you've ever experienced. Yeah. And they, then these bats were just spreading everywhere. But somehow they had a completely uneventful trip to the north. After they got rid of the cult. It was the cult's fault. Everything was fine. The once cult they got was rid not cult. noisy. I think it was the people's fault. <laughs> I don't know why the cult wasn't noisy. Because <laughs> biologically, human beings make noise from their vocal cords. No, not their not tongues. Not from their tongues. Oh, okay. So maybe that was another little problem the movie had. The whole thing. The whole thing. Ratings. <sighs> All right. This movie very much reinforced our working theory that Netflix originals are not written by human beings. Right. Just robots. And while there is a level of entertainment to be found in that. Like, it's kind of funny to read something <laughs> that was written by an AI program. Yeah, it's very funny. I like doing that. It's not worth the time to invest into a movie, especially when the AI that works for Netflix is really good at setting up a premise. They know how to do that. They, they establish a premise and they get you hooked in and mm -hmm. you're like, yes. What is going on? And then they just don't ever resolve anything. Yeah. And I mean, I guess spending five minutes showing us that they finally got to the place where they're safe is more resolution than open house where it was just there was nothing. Yeah, for sure. But it was extremely disappointing. And when you couple that with the offensive level carelessness around... Mm -hmm representing deaf culture the specifics of this movie there were good things about it but those two things themselves are so overwhelmingly bad <laughs> that i have to give this movie one hey is that a chuck norris picture on the old lady's wall out of five <laughs> that is a that is quite a measurement scale right it's gonna be hard to follow you're welcome <laughs> Wow, man. Okay. Yeah, I I was very disappointed. I I do think that there pe some people might watch this movie just for the fun of hating on it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of recommend that. But if you have any interest in actually watching an actual movie th with a plot and anything worth actually seeing, not so much. Go watch A Quiet Place. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're going to uh, there's a sequel now, so you can just do that. <laughs> I don't know if that's out yet. But anyway, um, you know, this movie was so Hollywood, like all the way down to the issues with deaf representation, like the the kind of thoughtless, bumbly, but not really evil, just unthinking mm -hmm. design methodology. I don't know. I mean, it is evil. It's just an insidious kind of evil yes. where they can go, but I didn't know and try to you know, yeah. not have any consequences. Yeah, and then and then they're like, what is this, cancel culture? And then you got a whole yeah. thing. I don't know. I didn't hate it as much as you did. Obviously, I've said a few things throughout that were ridiculous and stupid, but, you know, I don't really have a problem with ridiculous and stupid movies. I saw in some reviews, a lot of people said it had really placid pacing was a term I saw, and I'm like, it didn't. It was very fast moving, I thought. Just yeah, there stuff was, kept happening. There were always people being eaten by pterodactyls. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think it worked in that way. It was, you know, very lightweight Hollywood f popcorn fluff. And it was dumb, but it was kind of fun, you know, not appealing. But overall, enough to give for me to give it 
two and a half. Hey, is that a Chuck Norris picture on that lady's walls out of five? Nice. So, yeah, I mean, not good. This isn't a good movie, but. No, eh. it really wasn't. Perhaps we just got the twins mixed up. Maybe they were switched at birth. Oh, switched at and birth. And the silence was the evil twin. What was the other twin that we watched? Evil twins. Dead Silence from 2007, also available on Netflix, but not a Netflix original, is the evil twin, or the good twin, of The Silence. I was not going to watch that movie. But you did. And the reason I did is because I happened to glance up during the opening credits at exactly the moment when it told me that Donnie Wahlberg was in this movie. (laughs) And I was like, what? And actually, he was the highlight of this movie. (laughs) Yes, he was. I mean, they could have really done more with that. He was a, I think they let him ad lib a bunch because he kind of created this character who for some reason was constantly shaving, who just... Right? What was, why? (laughs) I don't know. He just spent all his time shaving. He was like, he was like a young Bostonian Columbo. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he would make little quips and things. It was weird. He was the only comic relief in the movie, I think. And it was, it was quite comedic. I enjoyed it. So the movie is, I should preface this by saying, I reviewed this movie in 2014 on this very website. Um, you can look up that review. Uh, For an in-depth study of it. And somewhat in-depth. <laughs> it's probably about as many words as we're going to do right now. And I found it to be worthy of four out of five some things. I don't remember what the uh, measuring stick was. And, you know, it was kind of fun to get to see it again and see how I feel about it. It has a surprisingly convoluted plot, I felt like. Like, there were a lot yes. of working parts to the plot. But it all comes together because mm-hmm. because actually one of my complaints with the movie is that it's kind of a thrill ride movie in a way where it's just the main character doesn't really seem to have any agency. He just goes from scene to scene getting a new piece of information each time and just kind of doing whatever he's forced to do mm-hmm. by the plot. And so it's kind of like, what's the point? There's no real story here. It's just kind of an info dump in a way. So that's a thing. But the reason they did such a big info dump sort of storytelling is because there was a big mystery behind what was going on. And it kind of comes together in the end and explains it to you. And there's a really fun twist. There's a super fun twist. Which was the point where I realized, oh, I must have watched this with you the first time. Because when I first saw (laughs) the thing related to the twist, I was all, oh, I know what's happening here. You did know. I did know. I knew too, because I remembered the twist. And I was like, oh, yeah, you can totally tell. Uh Which, that's my favorite kind of twist, is they didn't fake it. I mean, they faked it. It's not real. But... They did the whole movie as if the twist were happening rather than kind of throwing it in. But they did it in that way where when you, the first time through, you don't know that it's happening. And you go back and you're like, oh my gosh, how did I miss that? (laughs) It's so obvious. That's really fun. So, I mean, it's fun. It's a really dumb movie. Like this whole thing, the whole premise and everything is ridiculous and it's silly and it's fun. I talk all the time about how scary movies don't scare me, right? Like, I am not afraid of any of these things. They are all fictional. They do not make it into my nightmares. Like, I don't, whatever. I'm not truly afraid. I just get, I have physical reactions to grossness and whatever. This movie is one of the rare exceptions because the bad guy is a ventriloquist dummy. And they are the creepiest thing on the planet. Like, scarier to me than any aliens or ghosts or (laughs) zombies or clowns even. Like, I'm not afraid of clowns, but you give me a ventriloquist dummy in a story, and I'm like, oh, that thing is definitely possessed and is trying to kill us. I mean, would you be more scared if there were 101 of them? Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. Like, it is literally one of those things. Like, if someone gave me a clown doll, I'd be like, ha ha, that's a funny joke. It's scary. Ooh. If someone gave me a ventriloquist dummy, I would burn it in the fire pit. This movie actually includes, at one point, a ventriloquist dummy clown. Which was the one clown I've ever been afraid of in my life. 
<laughs> yeah, it's yeah. pretty upsetting. Yeah. So that's to me one of the fun elements is that it it like had a thing that is legitimately made me feel anxious, even though yeah. I know I shouldn't feel anxious because it's just a doll. <laughs> it's funny because most of the scary things in movies are either something that's dangerous or something supernatural, like a ghost, like who knows what that could do. But the one that really scares you is the one that is in real life a hunk of wood. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like you just look at them and they look like they're going to come to life and kill you. Yeah. Oh, because they usually do. Uh-huh. It's very common. I mean, have you ever heard a story about a ventriloquist dummy where it didn't end up killing somebody? Yes. Arrested development. Right. The really offensive ventriloquist <laughs> puppet plot line. Maybe in that's worse than murder. Arrested <laughs> development. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. So anyway, I did watch this movie with you, and I feel like I do want to rate it. Okay. Um... And because it was entertaining, because it had one of the new kids on the block, <laughs> because it contained a monster that I was actually afraid of, I am going to give this movie four phantasmic laughters out of five. That sounds familiar to me. That is a rating I'm, I know. And I actually continue seven years later giving it also four phantasmic laughters out of five. It uh, is a solid movie. It's dumb, but solid fun. Oh, yeah. This is not like a classic by any means. No. This isn't a movie that's going to, you know, end up in a vault being shot out into space so that we remember <laughs> who we were. Although maybe it should. <laughs> you think? This I don't know. a good example of who we were. I mean, it really kind of is. But yeah, it's it's very solid. It has has good acting the plot was entertaining and man that twist mm, yes that was pretty fun delicious yeah so i truly enjoyed that well now that we're done talking about those delightful twin movies indeed what are we moving on to tomorrow tomorrow's film is a little thing called ginger snaps which as you know is the name of a cookie oh Yes, it's a scary, scary cookie. <laughs> and it's from the year 2000. And for an evil twin for this movie, I was like, mm, is there a snickerdoodle movie? <laughs> a lemon bar movie? I couldn't find any other can cookie movies. Can we find movies. a movie about real Girl Scouts? <laughs> well, we can, but that's not really horror. No, it is not. It's about horror. So since I couldn't find anything like that, and there's obviously no other movies called Ginger Snaps, our evil twin for this movie is almost called Ginger Snaps. It's called Ginger Snaps 2. So that will be an interesting Ooh, combo. So we're getting a movie and a sequel combo. Indeed. I like it. So be prepared for angsty 2000s teenagers. Oh, oh and werewolves. Again. Excellent. <laughs> we'll check in with that tomorrow. Bye. Why was there a giant 